uh, Dave Wichers here. Uh, he's presenting Overstop 10 2013. Uh, well, actually, it's the first conference where he's pre he presenting that one, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're pretty much looking forward to you and uh, glad that you came. All right, thanks. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in the unfortunate situation that I'm in the track in the entire conference where I think I have the most competition. If you looked at the schedule, the other two talks that are going right now are pretty strong talks that I would love to be in, but I'm here. But I appreciate you guys coming to mine. Um, so I'm not going to go through every little detail of the OS Top 10, even though there's only 10 items. I didn't feel like going blow by blow through what is SQL injection and cross-site scripting for many of you is probably uh, stuff you already know. But I do want to talk about the, what the top 10 is, uh, how we built it, what changed in uh, this version, and also talk about how we're talking about changing the process for future updates, because that was a subject of some debate for this particular one, if anyone followed the leaders list, on the, or the OWASP top 10 list. And, um, and then I have some slides to go through, maybe the, the first four items in the top 10 if we have time, but I suspect we won't have time for that. Um, but this, they'll be in the slides and I'll make another available online that you guys all can go through and read and download. So what is the OS top 10, first of all? Um, a lot of people think of it as a standard. It's not a standard. It doesn't say standard anywhere in it. It was intended to be an awareness document. It is an awareness document. Some people treat it as a standard. If they want to choose to do so, that's fine. <laughs> but um, that's not what we're doing. And I think we're achieving its goal as an awareness document. Unfortunately, uh, if you measure the success of its awareness in stamping out problems, you'll notice that SQL injection and cross-site scripting are still in there from 2003, and they're still here in 2013. So from that perspective, we might be completely failing. But at least we're trying to get the world word out there that these are important things for people to focus on. And, um, and every once in a while we introduce a new kind of vulnerability that people hadn't heard of into the top 10 and people start focusing on it and it does seem to have some impact. And I'll talk about uh, how that happens to be uh, in uh, a little later on. So when we first came out with the top 10 back in 2004, it was probably like the third or fourth OWASP project. Um, there weren't very many projects at the time. Um, and then there's the release date. We're doing it, we did it in 03 and then 04 and then we said, nah, every year is crazy. So Every two years is also a little crazy, so finally we got an every three years kind of life cycle, which seems good in terms of effort required versus um, the uh, amount of change in the, in the industry. And plus, because a lot of people standardize on it as in terms of reporting and tools, things to look for, uh, I think changing it every three years gives the world time to deal with it on a reasonable basis as well. So that's why we don't actually update it every year. So here's a little history about me, and I don't want to go through every one of these things, but I've been doing AppSec for 25 years. Um, I started being a consultant uh, a year after I, uh, right after I got out of school. And in, um, in 98, I got to start focusing on web security, and I've been pretty much focused on that ever since for the last 15 years. Uh, in 02, I got a chance to start a company, and I've been uh, working hard there as I also do my OWASP stuff. But I've also been a long-term OWASP contributor. I started volunteering for OWASP at the, about the same time uh, we started our company. And I've, um, in 03, we came out with a top 10 for the first time. 04, uh, we actually helped, we created the OWASP Foundation itself. Um, Jeff Williams and I did that. I joined the board, which we formed at that time. I've been on the board ever since, although I am not running for re-election uh, this year, so I am gonna drop off the board, finally, after 10 years. And I was, for three, four years, I was the OWASP Conferences Chair. I organized a conference in US and Europe uh, every year for three years. And then now I give other volunteers the opportunity to do that kind of work. And it's great because these conferences are awesome. And then I worked on ASVS and the OWASP Cheat Sheet Series, which I'll talk about. Um, so what is the OWASP Top 10 for 2013? Hopefully you guys have already looked at it. If you haven't, this is the list at least. And the main change is that we added A9. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to talk about the changes in sort of significance of order first rather than top 10 order. So I'm going to talk about this one first. Um, we also merged, uh, we had to make room. Obviously there were 10 items before. Uh, we didn't drop one off the list. Instead we merged two that we thought were uh, related into one. And that was the, oops, sensitive data exposure. Uh, we used to have, uh, you know, good, use good network security, SSL to protect your sensitive data on the network. And we also had um, protect your data at rest, and we just combine those two together uh, to, make, to make room. 
Um, so that's the main change in the top 10. We reordered some of those. So what is it and what didn't change? The, the top 10 is, is about risks. It's not about vulnerabilities. I mean, they are vulnerabilities, but the point is, is organizations care about risk. So the OWASP is ordered by risk, and we have a risk ranking system that helps us define uh, what order they're in, and that's how the ordering got rearranged in the top 10, for example, because we think the risk landscape changed a little bit uh, in the last three years. And uh, we use the risk uh, rating methodology that OWASP has as a guide to, for our risk rating methodology. So this is the, the rating methodology. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we have three likelihood factors and one impact factor, basically. So we look at what's the likelihood that your app will even have this flaw? What's the likelihood that an attacker could find it? And what's the likelihood that an attacker could sex successfully exploit it? Those are the likelihood factors, and that calculates a weight. And then we have a, what's the impact? If they are successful, that's another way you combine those and you get a score. And the, the, the score is actually the lowest number is the highest risk. So if those are all ones, it would be the easiest, most prevalent, super easy to find and exploit thing that is devastating uh, attack. We don't have one, but uh, this is SQL injection, which is number one is, or injection in general, is the, has the lowest score on that rank. Now the only one of these four factors that we actually use uh, empirical data about is prevalence. We, ha we collect prevalence data from a number of sources. We had seven uh, providers of data that we used. We took all their data, uh, tried to make it similar <laughs> so we could organize it. It's a bunch of work and then that helped us get our prevalence data. But we don't have other data for those so we're just using our professional opinion of all the other uh, factors in there. We'd like to make that more evidence-based rather than just our personal opinion, but we haven't been able to get that kind of data publicly to, to use. So we reordered seven, we added one, as I mentioned, merged two into one, and we also broadened an existing one slightly, and I'll talk about um, that. We built it the same way uh, as 2010. Uh, typically the model is uh, the OWASP Top 10 team, which is just a couple guys, basically. Um, we put a, a draft together, we release that for public comment, uh, and that draft includes the data call and the data analysis and so forth. Put it for public comment, and then we leave it out there for at least three months. In the OWASP community, we get comments from everywhere, all kinds of debate on the mailing list and suggestions and so on and so forth. And we take um, all the, you know, what I'll call the constructive comments and the ones that are very specific, hey, you know, put a period there, or hey, we should include a reference to that or whatever. And I gather all those together and we actually document Here's the comment, and this is exactly what we changed in the document, and we post that online so it's available for, for public record. Now what we're thinking about doing for the next release is um, uh, getting more people involved earlier. So it's, a, there's, it's sort of a more open process of building the initial draft, which I think will be uh, more in line with uh, OS principles and get more people involved, which is great. So, and this is the actual chart comparing the old one to the new one. So I've, this is how things moved around. So the main thing is, let me talk about each one of these real quick. So the first, the A2 and A3 reversed order. Um, not that cross-site scripting is any less prevalent, because it isn't. Um, and I don't think actually uh, authentication session management issues are actually more prevalent. I think people are actually looking for them more. More consultants are really looking at them really, really hard. Um, uh, it also could be an artifact that we included more prevalence data from consulting companies. So we had a more balanced data set between consultants versus tools. Those tools are terrible at finding authentication and session management problems. They just, it's very, very difficult for them to find. So when we expanded our data set and we had about half consultants and half tool vendors providing data, the consultant's data helped push up the prevalence of that particular issue. So I think that's what caused that. I don't think fun anything fundamentally changed in the last uh, three years in that score. Um, one thing that did, it was interesting, was cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities seemed to drop significantly in prevalence. And I, I can only hope that's because we put CSRF in the OWASP Top 10 in 2007 and they've had, the world has had six years to deal with that problem. It's not a ridiculously difficult problem to eliminate. In fact, a lot of frameworks are building in CSRF defenses automatically, so developers don't have to do them one at a time. 
and therefore I think the actual prevalence of that issue in the wild has dropped which is great. So, I mean, that's my one, one little success I can point at the top 10 going, hey, we brought this to the world and the world's focused on it and it's starting to go down in prevalence in the wild and I think the top 10 had something to do with that. I mean, before the top 10 pu published Sea Surf as an issue in 2007, almost nobody knew about it. I mean, the security guys did it, the hardcore people, but the world at large didn't even know what this issue was. And so I think that in terms of awareness, we're meeting our mission. And so that dropped and everything else below it moved up by one. But then we merged the cryptographic storage and the cryptographic uh, transport items together into sensitive data and just say, look, if you've got sensitive data, you've got to protect it, whether it's on the wire or it's in storage or in the browser, wherever it is, you've got to protect it. Um, so that's what we, what we did. And then the new one we added was uh, A9. So how did we get to this new... A9. Um, so way back, well way back, three years ago in um, the, the A6, the security misconfiguration, I had one sentence in there that said, hey, when you want to secure your platform, one of the things you have to do is make sure all your libraries are up to date. That's a configuration thing. Right now, now it's a developer issue, the developers have to update their libraries. So anyway, I even, and I even had it in bold. I mean, we didn't bold that here. It was actually in bold in the document, but it's one little sentence amongst millions and nobody really noticed. Um, so, but that was our inkling then that this was important. Now, why is this important? Well, development has been evolving rapidly, as you all know, in the last 10, 20 years. And what's really, really happened in the last 10 years is the, the, the amount of code that we depend on to then build our new applications has exploded. And that's fine. I mean, that's, it's, it's a good thing because we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We can all build amazing applications very quickly because we have these very powerful frameworks that do all kinds of really cool stuff for us. And that's great. But there's a, there's a cost to that. When you start relying on all this other code, well, all code has vulnerabilities, whether you wrote it or not. So when you want to secure your app, your code has to have secure code that you wrote and all the code below has to be secure too. Well, the only way to deal with that is for you to update that code. So here's the problem is now um, probably 80% of the code that's out there, maybe more like 90% is libraries you're using and your little custom codes on top, right? Now, it doesn't mean you're using all of that code, but it's there. So when there's a vulnerability in that code, you should update it in case you're using that code. And in some cases, you absolutely know that vulnerability is exposed to an end user and you absolutely must update it, particularly if it's a UI technology like Spring or Struts, for example, in Java, it, it's the UI framework, so it's directly exposed to the user. So of course the user can attack handy vulnerabilities in those libraries. So Aspect Security did a study last year, or two years ago now, uh, with a company called Sonatype. Sonatype runs Maven Central. Maven Central is the repository for all the Java libraries. And it's a single place where any developer can go and download open source libraries and get them. Well, so they have access to some data that's amazing that no one has access to. They know how many times every library has been downloaded from Maven Central. And they know every version of every library. And so we asked them for uh, the most popular frameworks which is about 25 odd frameworks and we also asked for data about the the top five or six security libraries and we said hey give us all the data you can about that so we found out there was you know 115 million downloads of these libraries in one year and we found out that almost a quarter of those downloads were of libraries that had known flaws in them there were cves or whatever on those libraries that at the time it was downloaded it's not like you, you download stuff and then like three years later you measure, well, how many vulnerabilities were there in those downloaded libraries that nobody knew about at the time. That's not what we measured. We measured how many were downloaded when it was already known to be vulnerable. Well, why are people doing that? Because they're not paying attention. <laughs> they're, they're used to, they use a library and it works functionally and they've been using it for two, three, five years and they keep using it and keep downloading it and whatever. And, they're not paying attention. Well, people need to. So if a quarter of downloads are vulnerable, that's of known vulnerabilities. Now, 
how, how long is this safe pie going to stay safe? Over time, we're finding more and more vulnerabilities, and then that pie is going to shrink, shrink and shrink into what's not as safe things. But that's a future problem. You can't you know, tell people to predict the future and avoid things because they're going to be broken in the future because you never get anything done. But to download known vulnerable things today is a problem. We need to address that. So that's why we added A9. And I've, there's, there was significant debate on the top 10 list about whether it's appropriate. They're like, well, that's not a developer thing or that's not a whatever. And I'm like, well, of course it's a developer thing. Only the developers can update their libraries and then make sure that update doesn't break their application. Right? Now, one of the things this implies, though, is if you build an app or you buy an app from a vendor or get an open source app or doesn't matter, and you deploy it and you like it and it's running and it's working and you don't want to change it because it's not worth the money to, or you don't need to change it, and you run it for year after year after year, it's aging over time. It's getting more insecure every day. So you need to get new libraries deployed into that application. So even if you're not actively developing that piece of software, we all need to bite the bullet and say, well, we need to actively maintain uh, that software. So even if you're not directly making new features, you should probably have a team that looks at that app every quarter, let's say, and goes, hey, what libraries have, have been changed or any known vulnerabilities in those libraries? And if so, bring them in. And unfortunately, it's not just a bring them in, uh, you know, rerun, restart your server, done, because those new libraries might have a different interface, might break some functionality. So you, unfortunately, it's work. <laughs> You've got to bring it in. Uh, if the APIs didn't change, then you could rerun all your aggression tests, and if that all passes, you're probably good. If something fails, obviously, you have to fix code. But if they change the APIs, then unfortunately, you have to rewrite your code to adopt to that. So this is a non-trivial thing to do. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's necessary because otherwise you're going to get um, completely owned. And um, in fact, in the Java role, which is where a lot of our customers happen to be, um, it's a really, really big problem because Struts, which is the older popular framework, and now Spring, which is the new popular UI framework, has been getting critical vulnerabilities reported in it every year where I can literally run remote code on your server through those vulnerabilities and there's nothing your developers could have done to avoid it. It's, it's exposed. <laughs> it's the UI. It's the front door of your application. So as soon as the vulnerability is found, every website on the internet with spring version whatever whatever is ownable until they release a new version. Now usually they try to not make that public until they fix it, and then they go, we fixed it, and oh, here's this huge problem. The problem is, is it's fixed in, in Central, and there's 10 million apps out there that haven't updated yet, and some of those won't update for five years. <laughs> but if that's your app, you probably shouldn't be taking that risk. So that's what A9 is about. Um, it's super important. I mean, we put it down low on the list in terms of risk, but if you have a spring vulnerability, for example, that should be A1 on your list. <laughs> because I don't have to explore your app and learn how it works. I just know exactly how to exploit that. Go to your website, do a little testing. Oh yeah, they're using spring, it's obvious. Bang, game over. So that's why this is a huge important. And I'm not going to go through all the details on these slides, but these, I put them on there so when you download them later you can look at those. Um, but there's, because there's, there's a lot of bullets on here I'm not going to talk about. Um, so. How do you deal with this problem? Ideally, uh, every time you built your software, or if it was under maintenance, maybe once a month or something, you would do a check to see if your, your libraries are out of date. And hopefully that would be automated. And because I think A9 is going into the top 10, I think there's going to be a lot more work from open source vendors and commercial vendors to help automate this problem. And in fact, I'll show you an example of stuff that has existed before we even put this in there that you can use. Now, an even better level of automation would not only is the library out of date, but are there known vulnerabilities in it? Now, the one thing I want to caution you is, you know, clearly if there's a known problem, then everyone knows about it. Probably, though, most updated libraries probably fix some security stuff on almost every update. They just didn't tell you about it. And it wasn't a publicly known issue, so they didn't need to publicly acknowledge it. 
but they get, they learn about security issues all the time and they fix them and then they don't tell the world about it because it's probably a good thing not to tell the world about it because if you've got that old library, you don't want the world to know about all the things they fix in security because they're going to own your app. So even though it's not known to have vulnerabilities in it, you probably should update anyway. Now again, that's work. So you got to do the risk reward kind of thing. But I would encourage people to update all the time. Certainly when it's an active development, you should just be updating all the time and that's when it's easiest to deal with the pain of changing your code or, or what have you. Um, now if you're not doing automation, then by hand you got to do it once in a while. And it's not super hard, but it's a pain. Um, uh, you could also search around CVE and see, hey, does it have any new volumes about spring or whatever and stuff like that and doing it by hand, but obviously that's hard, particularly if you have a huge portfolio. So I think some tools are going to come along there to help with this, um, and I'll show you an example of one right here. So um, again, this is a job example, and, so, and, and there's a technology called Maven, which a lot of people use to, for, for Java development that helps automate build and uh, building your code and pushing it out and things like that. And there's a plugin for it called Versions. So in the Versions plugin, you, you go into Maven, you install it, and you configure it, and you say, I want to run version on whenever you want. So you can say, whenever I hit this button, or every night, or every time I build the software, whatever. And it produces this nice report. And on the left-hand side, it tells you what's out of date and what's not out of date. So I ran this on a set of libraries for an app that I was doing a security review on. And sure enough, every library except two was out of date. Today, that's incredibly prevalent. You go to most development teams and you ask them about this, and they're like, well, I don't even know all the ver libraries I use. Never mind the versions of those libraries. Never mind keeping track of um, you know, whether I should be updating them and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a serious problem. And hopefully developers will start paying more attention. And then it also gives you the details about well, what version are you on, what's the next incremental version, what's the next major release, so on and so forth. So great. In fact, versions can be run in an aggressive mode where when it detects your library is out of date, it'll automatically download the latest version and automatically include it in your project and your developers don't have to do anything except deal with, with stuff when it breaks things. <laughs> That's the problem, is if it automatically updates your libraries, it might break stuff. So most developers don't turn on that aggressive download, but it's there. So now, if there was out of date, you could have a job that looks at this, and if there's anything significant or whatever, send an alert or an email or whatever. But that's the minimum kind of stuff you want to make it easy. We need that, and a lot of people aren't doing it. And this stuff's free. This, this is free. The only thing you don't get here is the security details. Are there any CVEs or any whatever? So I imagine some commercial vendors will start producing tools to help with that, and maybe even some open source solutions as well. And what they do in other languages, I don't know, but hopefully this will help encourage similar capabilities in, in every web development language. So, so I told you we, we, we merged those two together to make room. Um, so I think I've already covered, covered the merge there. Um, the, uh, what, what we did also do is we broadened one. So A7, and oh, I've also studied, started using this notation, by the way. I don't know if you guys even paid attention to it, but we used to always number them A1 through A10. And of course, next year, it's A1 through A10 again. And it's kind of confusing because you've got all these A1 through A10s from five different versions of the top 10. So I've started putting the year in front. <laughs> So you'll notice in the top 10 itself and in my slides and stuff that every time I refer to a, a something, there's a date in front of it so that when it's still on some blog post or something somewhere five years later, you're, well, what version of A whatever are they talking about? So that's why I'm doing that. It's a simple change, but I think it'll help clarity. So in A7, it used to be called failure to restrict URL access. Well, really, it was about function level access control. In other words, every application should do two kinds of access control. Are you authorized for this function? And are you authorized for this data? And we already have insecure direct object references. That's the data piece. And we used to say failure to restrict URL access because that was the primary problem that people were not doing because they would a URL would go to a single function and they weren't checking and there could be 10 functions there or only one function there, whatever. They weren't checking and you were doing things you shouldn't do. But that's not the only way to access a function in a web app, right? There's lots of ways of doing it. 
So a, a typical way is you got a URL plus one or more parameters that says what function am I actually invoking. So I put an example somewhere like right here, you know, go into some page and there's an action parameter called transfer funds or I like this post or whatever, right? And so that combination of URL and parameters is the invocation of the function. So we just broaden it to say, look, it's, it's about all ways of accessing functions, not just URLs, and you need to protect them all, right? And it's, that's, that's all it is. It's just trying to be more inclusive. I mean, I always sort of mentally thought of it as being all of that, but now I just made it explicit in there. So that was um, that change. So let me go through the details again of, the, of the, how we built it. And I actually want to open up the floor if anyone has any comments or ideas. But um, we, uh, you know, the team got together and we said, okay, well, everybody who gave us data before, are you willing to give us data? Okay. And then, um, then I knew a bunch of new vendors that had, were sort of bigger, in, in my world at least, and so I went to them and said, you want to give us data? And they're like, sure, sure, here's all this data. So they, they, they gave us the data set and I'm doing my typical analysis. And then um, we actually then released the top 10 and one of the, for draft, for comment, and one of the people in the community said, hey, um, it would be nice to make your data set open so we can do our own analysis. I mean, I did, you know, we did our analysis and we ranked them, but maybe we did it wrong or maybe people want to use the data for some other kind of an, I don't know. I'm like, great, o OWASP is, is open and the more the merrier. So I said, I went to every provider and I said, you know, you, three of you, you've already got a public report. <laughs> Here's the link, you, you know. So I, I linked that right into the document. In fact, I did that last time. If it was public last time, I had already linked to it, but it wasn't public for everyone. In fact, my company's data wasn't public. So I went to all the guys and said, hey, will, will you make your data public? And everyone who hadn't said, sure. And they had a month or so, and they made it public on their site, in their format. And then now you're linked to it. So you can go to the top 10, and if you want, you can click on the link and go to the White Hat data, or the Veracode, or Aspect Security, or whoever, and, and get their data. Now, what I'm thinking about doing in the next version is doing a data call that's public so anyone can contribute. Because I did have some disappointed vendors and I apologize to them, but towards the end they're like, hey, I've got data and I want to contribute it too. And I'm like, well, we're so late in the process and probably won't have much effect and there's a bunch of work, so sorry. And I hate excluding OWASP contributors because that's like ingrained in me is that that's a bad thing. So, that, I take a lesson out of that, next time I'll do an open call. And if I get 50 data providers, well then I have a lot more work. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna issue a data call with a required format for the data. So that the data is hopefully consistent across all those providers. And so then I can hopefully just dump it all on a spreadsheet and it's already sort of organized in a similar way, which will be a lot less work for me and more work for them, but that if they want to contribute, they can or, or not. And then, and I also think that data will be more useful for you guys. If you ever want to do any analysis, it will be a little bit more organized. So that's what we're going to do about the, the, the data. So we publish it in February, comments for over 90 days, and then we, we popped it out in, in June of, 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 of this year. And there's a link to all the comments. So if you want to see all the comments that specifically cause changes to the top 10, you can go there. If you want to see all the comments, they're in the history of the OS top 10 list, and you can see there was some spirited debate and so on and so forth uh, going on there if you're, if you're interested in that in historical reasons. So in terms of, of openness and for sort of participation and being very clear on how that works, I mean, we're, we're one of the most open projects from that perspective because we have this formal comment period and we document people's comments and we say this is what we did to deal with them, so on and so forth. Um, but we, I think we'd like to get more openness in terms of the participation before the draft comes out. Because there was a lot of complaints, and I agree with them actually, that you know, all of a sudden a draft pops out and everyone's like, oh, top 10's going again. And wait, I think I missed the bus. I wanted to get involved before the, the draft came out and the ink is not totally dry, but it's hard to change the document significantly when all that work has been done to put in this, you know, because the drafts are not draft. They're, they look like a done top 10, except they say draft on the front. And if you took the word draft off, it, you'd be ready to go that second. So I think getting people involved early, an open call for data, 
and also an open call to say, hey, if anyone can think of ways of producing stats in the other areas, like the likelihood of successful attack, the likelihood of discovery, the impact, then we can get, use more data to help well, organize the top 10. But at the same time, just because that's our methodology, that's our choice. We want to sort of back up our position so we can defend the top 10 in its order. But at the same time, if we feel like something new and important needs attention, it's in our opinion a top 10 risk, we're going to put it in there. So the vulnerable components is another example. In 07, we put CSRF in there when it was number 32 on the prevalence list. But he said, no, 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 we know it's in every app in the world. It's just not being looked for, so it's not in any prevalence data. So we stuck it in at number five, and three years later, it was number five, because <laughs> the people started looking for it. So I think that was a, a win. And then the same thing for vulnerable components. You know, we fundamentally believe this is important, and now that it's out there, I think people will start looking at that. And I know for a fact, in three years, that we're gonna see a lot of data the people are looking for it, they're finding this issue, helping customers fix it, which is good, right? So we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna not put our blinders on and just report what the stats say. We're gonna do what we think makes sense. And I think overall, that's the, the best interest of the top 10 and, and its user base. And then we wanna get some people involved in writing and deciding what the top 10 is before the ink is dry, when it's easier to change. And I, I'm totally open with that. It's more work, so one of the things we've been trying to do is make this process extremely efficient, because we're the guys who do most of the work, but I think in the spirit of openness and the big O of OWASP, which I totally believe in, let's get people involved earlier who want to. So we'll do a call, and, and if I get 100 volunteers, I don't know how I'm gonna do with that, but we'll figure out a way to get everyone who wants to participate to. Maybe we'll have a meeting or we'll just start throwing out ideas or whatever. I don't know the details, but first off, let's ask for the volunteers and then deal with what we get. I mean, if we get eight, well, then that's a little different story and we can have a different structure for that. Um, but yeah, I want more people to work on it with it if, if they want to, that's great. Um, and I think that'll also address uh, some of the concerns that have been out on the list about, oh, it's an aspect security only thing. Well. It's the only documented OWASP that we put out for public comment that everyone can talk about, so not exactly an aspect only thing, but I get their point. <laughs> so let's get more people involved, that's great, right? Um, so I have slides to go through the first A1 through A4 that didn't change at all, but I don't have enough time and I didn't figure I would, but I stuck them in there just in case. So I'm gonna skip through those and go to a references page that uh, I got all kinds of cool animation and blah, 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 but um, we'll skip all over that. Oh, one thing I do want to mention real quick. I've got to give it a commercial for this. So if you guys, I assume most of you are, are sort of new to web security because you'd, otherwise you'd be in the, all the hacker talks and then the other tracks. But um, one of the best resources for, for developers, security people, particularly new people, is this project at OS called the OS Cheat Sheet Series. If you're not familiar with those, I strongly encourage you to get familiar with them. The first one that was ever written was the cross-state scripting cheat sheet written by Jeff Williams. And he wrote that because I kept on nagging him uh, when I was teaching all the time. I'm like, Jeff, I'm teaching hundreds of developers, thousands of developers every year on how to avoid cross-state scripting. And the guidance is fuzzy and confusing and you say, validate this or encode that, but it's not crystal clear exactly what to do. And he's like, well, I don't know the crystal clear answer. And I'm like, well, figure it out. <laughs> and then once he did, I said, well, why don't we put that on OWASP so everyone knows. And so he wrote this cheat sheet and it's, it's one of the best resources on how to avoid cross-site scripting. It's not 100% perfect by any means, but it's like three or four browser pages full of, of goodness that you have to do as a developer to avoid the problem. Whereas before that, we were pointing to the hacker XSS list that says, here's 150 pages of badness that you gotta avoid. So here, developer, read this 150 pages of badness and make sure none of that works. And they're like, yeah, right, I can't read that. Oh, here's read four pages of goodness and figure out what applies and apply that. Ah, okay, I can do that. Well, it was such a big hit, and I liked it personally so much, that while I was writing the top 10 for 2010, 
I wanted to put a link to a cheat sheet for every item in the top 10, and I didn't get there. I got four or five. I'm like, okay, well, it's good, it's better. But then people, all of a sudden there was one, and then there's three and four, and then people jumped on and started writing more, and then, and then now, there's, now there's like 35 of them. And so there is now one for everyone in the top 10, plus a whole bunch more. So if you guys, if you're anyone in your team, consultant, developer, whatever, needs guidance on how to deal with SQL injection or Crested scripting or whatever, there's a guide on how to do that. And there's relatively short and consistent things. So anyway, that's my commercial on the cheat sheets. Um, oh, so the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was if, if, you know, if you were hoping I was going to go blow by blow through the top 10, I apologize, I didn't have time. But I have done that before, and if you want to see me do it, there's a video of me doing it three years ago at the AppSec conference in, uh, in DC, and it's the old top 10, but you saw it didn't change much. So it goes through everything except for the new A9, which I did cover uh, now. Um, there is a beta presentation that's organized along the same lines. In other words, it says, here's the top 10, and here's A1, and A2, and A3, and A4. That's already out there. You can go grab that now. So if you wanted to present it to your team or whatever, you can go grab it. I'm going to take what I've done in this slide deck and merge the thing together to update that, and then we'll take it out of beta. And I'll also put this presentation online. So this one's more like the history and what changed and so on and so forth. But if you just want a straight OS Top 10 2013 presentation, bang, and nobody cares about history, and then that's the other presentation, right? Um, and one other thing that's really amazing to me is the number of translators that come out of the woodwork every time we publish the top 10. We, we, it was translated like seven different languages last time, which is awesome. And we've already got two done. I mean, they were done within 30 days. I mean, the team just jumped on it and bam. So the French one and I think the Chinese one is done. And then, you know, Spanish and a bunch of other ones are coming. So that's great as well. I, mean, I believe there's a German one coming, but I, I don't know that. Some, every once in a while there's a team that says we're going to do it, and of course they don't, but that's okay. Um, but there's a bunch of translated versions as well. So obviously if we can get the top 10 into the a native language of the developer, they're not programming language, of course, but what they speak, it's a lot easier for them to, of course, understand and, and use, which is awesome. Right? So that's it. So any questions about the top 10 or quick suggestions on how to do it better next time or whatever? Sure. The, between the draft and the final? The top 10 items did not change. The, the same thing happened before. Like by the, when the time it got out, it was kind of solid, which is one of the team's complaints that, hey, I couldn't involve it before it rearranged. But then the content changed a decent amount. Like, we have references to other resources or references to great tools or little tips, and that's great because everyone's like, oh, I got an idea, or oh, there's a great reference over here, whatever. And all that stuff comes in, and then there's a lot of editorial changes, you know, like, oops, spelling error, and this could be written better so it's more clear and so on and so forth. So it was mostly editorial. But, I mean, I do think the, that comment period is great because we added a lot of links to really good resources. And there was even OWASP projects I didn't know about that were really good, that were helpful, that I didn't have links to, and I would feel bad to not acknowledge their work and, and hopefully point people to use them, like the Java Encoders project and so on and so forth. So it was definitely much better. So, and CSP, oh, I, and I'm a huge fan of CSP, by the way. So if you guys don't know what content security policy is, go learn what it is, go apply it, Make it work, stamp out XSS on the planet, and we can all get off the stupid whack-a-mole treadmill for XSS, at least. I mean, content security policy is the first attempt or proposal at something to really stamp out cross-state scripting across your website, rather than doing it one at a time on thousands and thousands of flaws. So, one, one, one more. Do you have any thoughts on why um, C-Surf, out of all the top 10, dropped so much? Was it the prevalence, or was it the, um, the likelihood that you adjusted? Uh, well, maybe you missed it, because you maybe missed the very beginning of my talk. I don't know, but I specifically mentioned that. But it, the prevalence did drop in, in the data set that we looked at. And 
I don't know for a fact, but I, as I mentioned before, I believe that it's because of the attention the top 10 has brought to it and people are focusing on it and frameworks are building sea surf defenses into the framework so the developers don't have to solve it one at a time, which is exactly the right solution we need. And I think that really has knocked the prevalence down. So that's exactly it. More that's questions? It. All right, uh, thank you. Well, maybe, maybe I have one. Okay. There was a discussion on the mailing list about a fork. About a fork? Yeah. Well, I think uh, that was somebody who was angry at the moment, and they changed their mind, hopefully. Is, is, but is it changed? Or? They, yeah, he's dropped it. But open source has that opportunity. You can fork anything, right? That's the beauty of open source. So if a community of OWASP members thought they could do a better OWASP Top 10 by themselves rather than working with us, which I would hope wouldn't be true. <laughs> but if they insisted, then that, that's the open source, and I'd be supportive of that. I mean, I wouldn't personally think it's the best thing for the top 10 project or OWASP, but that's their right. You know? Hopefully, and I've talked about making the project much more open, and let's get those people that weren't happy about the way it was built the first time, and let's get together and do it in a way that makes not everyone, nobody can make everyone happy, but hopefully more people happy. And hopefully that will die and we won't have to worry about that. So good question. Any, any more questions? Okay, thanks Dave for presenting OWASP Top 10. Yeah. <laughs>